On May 21st, 1979, the President of the United States invited a group of federal employees to meet with him in the cabinet room of the White House. This group of men and women, representative of all departments and employees, asked the President about retirement issues, the 5.5% pay cap, employee morale, seat, ethics, the issues of concern to every federal worker. First of all, I would like to welcome you here to the cabinet room. We had a meeting this morning with some of your bosses, and we meet here every two weeks with a full cabinet and the major agency uh, leaders. And then in between, I have uh, important meetings like this when we discuss matters of domestic and uh, foreign consequence to our nation. Today, however, is a special occasion for me to have a chance to meet with a broader representative group of career uh, civil servants in our government. You have been chosen, I think almost every one of you, perhaps everyone, because of outstanding achievement. And you've received awards for a special contribution to making our own uh, federal government more effective and more efficient and a greater credit to me and to the country. I think it's accurate to uh, point out that in the last two and a half years, I've been uh, privileged to be part of the uh, system which represents the American people in our government. And I've recognized uh, with a growing degree of appreciation the uh, high quality and dedication of, uh, of the overwhelming majority of people in the civil service system and in administrative positions as well. We are in a time, I believe, of uh, concern, uh, some uh, troubled uh, feeling on the part of the American people about energy, about inflation, about peace uh, in the world, about uh, taxation, about ethics, and you and I are partners in trying to address these troubled times to meet the challenges and also take advantage of the exciting opportunities that we have to make a great nation's government uh, even greater. American people are concerned about some of the things in government. When I campaigned around the country for two years, most of the expressions of concern about waste, red tape, overregulation, often came up in town hall meeting type formats from government employees themselves. And those uh, who work for government out in the field actually delivering services to the people of America see in a much more vivid way than the average uh, citizen in private life that any such uh, defect in the government ought to be rooted out. And I have tried since I've been in this office to form a partnership with you. When there is uh, waste, we want it to be eliminated. And almost all of you have contributed substantially and have been rewarded for your contributions to elimination of waste. We've tried to uh, reduce the red tape, get rid of unnecessary regulations. And on the rare occasions when there is fraud in government, I've tried to form a partnership with you to root out that fraud. We have uh, now gotten to Congress to pass uh, legislation authorizing inspectors general and the different agencies, and they will not only be a, a constant source of investigation and improvement and, ins and inspiration, but they're also a place where you can go if you have a complaint or if you have a beneficial suggestion or if you have a report to make about a defect in government and you will be protected from any sort of punishment. I think we need to have some protection for whistleblowers who come forward in a courageous way and say, this is wrong in our government. This is something that's been a defect for a long time and I want it rooted out. And in the past, there have been cases where those kinds of people have been punished. And the example of that punishment has restrained others from coming forward in an effective way to improve the government structure itself. We're now uh, seeking to uh, let the volunteers who want to come forward to take advantage of the senior executive service do so and the overwhelming portion of the senior executives do indeed want to participate in the kind of, uh, of uh, career opportunity that lets their initiative and lets their ability and lets their drive and their competence be recognized. And it's an inspiration to those who serve in government to do an even better job. 
And I think that Alan has been very pleased at the vast percentage of those who do have that opportunity to want to leave the security which they formerly had when everybody moves in lockstep, no matter who does a good job and who doesn't, to the kind of competitive world where excellence will be indeed rewarded. The suggestions that have been made last year by more than 42,000 federal employees and saved our nation over $315 million is a, a very good example of a new spirit of enthusiasm and dedication on your part and on the part of the other thousands of people like you. Some of them are very tiny savings, a few hundred dollars or maybe a few thousand dollars at most. I remember one by a NASA employee that saved our government, I think, $30 million when they recommended that when a space shuttle was launched, it might be launched not with a, a carefully designed new type of engine, but launched from the top of a modified 747. I know that you have some concerns that you want to express to me this afternoon, and this program being uh, taped on, uh, for television will let the other uh, federal employees know about our interrelationship with one another. And of course, we have members of the press who will be uh, in the room throughout this uh, session this afternoon. I think it's uh, good for me immediately to uh, put your mind at ease about two or three rumors that have been floating uh, throughout the, uh, the civil service in the past. There are absolutely no plans, for instance, to raise the minimum age uh, at which federal employees can be retired or can draw their retirement benefits. I don't know where the rumor came from. We have never considered it. I have never heard of it before it was uh, publicized in the paper. And several of the uh, civil servants have come to Alan Campbell and to my staff and said, why are you planning to raise the retirement, the minimum retirement age? We have no plans to raise the minimum retirement age. Another uh, question has been raised about the, uh, the prospect of the combining of Social Security uh, retirement with civil service retirement systems. I have taken no position at all on this. The Congress uh, mandated that a commission study the feasibility or advisability of this uh, step. And this commission is now doing the assessment work. They will make a recommendation, I think, uh, just before Christmas, December the 20th or something of that kind. And when that uh, recommendation is made, all of you will have access to it. The Congress will have access to it. Alan Campbell will have access to it. So will I. And following that, then decisions can be made accordingly. But, but in no case will the vested rights of, uh, of civil servants who have contributed to a retirement fund be lost. I, I can't imagine any circumstance under which those uh, vested retirement funds would be lost to you. This is a, a problem, I know, for many people who are concerned about security to, to have the investigation going on. But I want to emphasize again that no decisions have been made. I have not taken a position on it, and I do not intend to until I can very carefully study the report that will be concluded in December. I might uh, make two other points very quickly. We have established and the Congress, as you know, has approved the 5.5% pay cap. This was done under the intense uh, pressure of uh, nationwide inflation, including fringe benefits, which is included in the guidelines for private employees. It amounts to more than 6% increase for uh, federal employees. This is uh, not as much as many employees would like, but our nation is faced with a very serious prospect of increasing inflation. As you well know, the members of the cabinet, my own senior staff in the White House, have taken zero increase, not five and a half or six percent, but zero increase. And I firmly believe, in spite of the fact that some might not like the idea, that we in government ought to take the initiative in trying to constrain inflation. And a one percent difference between uh, what the federal employees get and the uh, maximum uh, limit under the voluntary wage guidelines, I don't think it's too great a sacrifice to make to provide an example and also to let the people who support us with their tax monies have confidence that we ourselves are willing to take action to control inflation in a time of trouble and challenge for our nation. The other point I'd like to make is that we have uh, 
now under preparation, a proposal to reform the compensation system. Uh, Alan Campbell will go over this in detail with you and uh, the, the head of the unions and those who are interested. We must take action of this type in order to uh, protect the comparability system. Otherwise, we're going to be back in a position which the government uh, witnessed many years ago when every year the Congress would decide whether or not to give a certain uh, salary increase. A and to bring the uh, federal employees pay scale into an accurate comparable situation with employees in private business and industry is a very important challenge for us all. I'm determined to bring this about so that there will be stability, credibility, and predictability in the establishment of uh, pay levels for federal employees in the future. Let me close by saying that I'm grateful that you would come. I recognize among you superior achievement. And because you are here, and because your own fellow workers know what an excellent job you have done, I know they'll look to you for advice and counsel and a report when you return back to your own jobs. We've got an, an outstanding nation. The people look to us for leadership. In the past, and even now, they have sometimes been disappointed. I get my share of the criticisms. When the people are disturbed, you'll have to share those criticisms with me. But that should just inspire us to work in a closer spirit of harmony and partnership and do an even better job to correct the defects and the problems that we all know do exist at times in the federal government and set an example for the rest of the nation and restore the credibility and the trust that's an integral part of strengthening our democratic system. We appreciate very much this opportunity to meet with you and uh, appreciate your encouraging statements about the uh, federal employees. Uh, I hope that uh, this meeting can serve to, to better communicate uh, your positions and your concerns uh, to federal employees throughout the country. I think the federal employees, over two million of them, look to you as their leader and the developer of the policies and the programs that, that affect their very uh, welfare. Uh, we do get feedback and there are concerns and perhaps perceptions by a number of employees that perhaps uh, a number of steps taken by the administration have uh, indicated a, an anti-attitude uh, towards employees, uh, such as the comparability uh, pay concept, the uh, rumors about retirement uh, changes, uh, uh, parking, uh, payment for parking for federal employees, uh, the overall ceiling on executive salaries, or restructuring of the pay system, and so forth. So I think all of those collectively have created uh, a great deal of misconception, perhaps, on the part of our employees. I wish you could uh, perhaps comment uh, generally on this, and do you see new positive programs on the horizon that will be favorable to the federal employee area? I think many of the things that we've already done have been indeed favorable. I don't think anybody would deny that the uh, new civil service uh, legislation is favorable. It does provide more competition, and it does provide, at the same time, a higher incentive for superb performance. But those are the kinds of characteristics that ought to pervade the feeling and the attitude of every employee, including the President of the United States. And it commensurately provides a higher degree of reward for those who are highly qualified and who are highly motivated and who do superior work. In my opinion, that is a major step uh, in the right direction. I, I, as I said before, I don't believe that the uh, little more than 6% increase in pay plus fringe benefits is too great a sacrifice to ask among the civil servants who uh, work with me in government. I would, I forgot to mention a few minutes ago about the uh, elimination of the right for free parking. As you know, this was a privilege that uh, will be enjoyed until October when it'll begin to be phased out that uh, has been enjoyed by just a very small portion of the federal employees. And uh, in a time of uh, energy shortages, in a time of, uh, of need, for uh, the conservation of energy in a time of very high uh, air pollution. I believe it's a proper decision to have the federal employees on the same basis as private employees, paying a very modest amount of uh, parking fee, which would be an instigation to the sharing of an automobile by several employees, where most of them now come in, as you know, one person in an automobile. And also, it'll tend to make the use of a new uh, rapid transit system more effective and, and more attractive. 
But I don't have any apology to make for that. It's something that's not highly popular, but I don't think it's an unwarranted uh, sacrifice to ask. In the pay area, Mr. President, do you, do you foresee that in the years ahead that federal employees will be treated as well as employees in the private sector in terms yes, of uh, I believe that if we can pass a reform compensation legislation that's now <clears throat> in preparation, the idea there is to have the federal employees in a very predictable way have pay schedules that are accurately comparable to those paid in the private sector. It also permits some flexibility from one community in our nation to another so that the uh, salaries are indeed comparable. That's, I think that's the goal that we want to achieve. My employees are the lowest pay in the wage grade system. They have no bumping rights to nobody. There's only one place to go is home. What's going to happen to these people when they don't have a job, no bumping rights, and most of them are too old to go out and train again? That there's nothing there for them. Well, I'm very concerned about the protection of the rights of employees of that kind, as you undoubtedly have known. When I was uh, beginning our programs to reorganize the government, to make it more efficient, more effective, I went into uh, every agency, every major agency in the uh, Washington area, personally, to answer questions. Sometimes five or six thousand people would come and answer, and I would answer questions in the uh, courtyards of the Pentagon and other places. And that was a frequent one asked, would you protect the uh, jobs of people who, uh, who might be affected when the government is reorganized? We have had six or seven or eight uh, reorganization plans already pr approved. And I think that I can say that within the best of our ability, I think successfully, we have protected the uh, careers of those who might adversely have been affected. The contracting uh, part of, uh, of a decisions are made when the, when the head of an agency is convinced, along with the Office of Management and Budget, that contracting itself can save, indeed, the taxpayers and the federal government substantial amounts of money. They make that recommendation then to me. And I have been extremely cautious in not putting forward my own approval of contracting outside full-time employees unless it is obvious that employees themselves will be protected and also that the government will benefit by reduced cost for a given level of service. Just to add, if I might, Mr. President, yeah. that under the new guidelines that OMB has put out, which will go into effect May 30th, any activity which currently is being done by the government, there is a bias in favor of calculating the cost by, at, by giving a 10% advantage to continuing it in the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, uh, there are employee protections in situations where there is contracting out. I don't mean to suggest for a moment there aren't problems. There are indeed problems, and there are very human problems. But uh, I can assure you that both the agency and the Office of Personnel Management do everything possible to protect the rights of employees and to go a step beyond that and uh, do everything possible to find them employment elsewhere in the system. And uh, may I add something, Please sir? Too. I uh, am in the Pentagon, and I do quite a lot of work with contracting. And every one of these contracts are treated very specifically on a case-by-case -case basis. And all of the very things that Mr. Campbell was talking about are considered you know, personal rights, uh, environmental impact, uh, impact on a, on a low-cost area or an area that's, uh, that's in trouble economically. And uh, there, are, there are occasions when we go on contract and find out that maybe it wasn't the very best case as Mr. McDuffie. I would say that that was rather an exception. In general, I would say the program is being very well monitored from where I sit. My impression has been, maybe from a, from a biased uh, point of view, that, that we are much more cautious now with the new regulations that Alan and you described than was the case three or four years ago. That's uh, correct. Sir. About protecting employees' that rights. That is correct, much more so. You, were, you mentioned the word ethics. I guess, the, and uh, I would solicit your support for this, and I know that you have given some support to it. I think that uh, the new conflict of interest was needed. There was no doubt about it. The perception was coming over that some people didn't care. Uh, but now I think maybe the pendulum has swung a bit far. And we are beginning to lose some really top-level people because of overly restrictive conflict of interest uh, regulations. 
And uh, I would suggest, sir, that I'm concerned that in the future that we may deny ourselves some very good people because these folk will be afraid that the very things they will do in government will preclude their following through with a career outside of government. This has been a concern to us. We've discussed it several times around this table when the full cabinet was here. And as you know, there was one amendment added to the ethics legislation in the Senate that we did not support that created a technical problem. And we are now working with the House and Senate to get those defects uh, corrected, uh, hopefully before the 1st of July. We have had a few people who have resigned uh, from government service because they felt that the new ethics legislation uh, restricted them uh, excessively in their future dealings with the government as it related to jobs that they were doing in the government now. I think that it was necessary for some people to leave the government because in the past there has been too much abuse by people who served in the government for a limited period of time, got special knowledge or influence within the government structure itself, went out and formed a, either a consulting firm or joined a legal firm and came back and used improperly their former contacts in the government. That kind of thing ought to be rooted out and I'm determined to root it out. The morale factor I think is a is a very significant one that we have to react to. I, I don't know of one situation where we've gotten favorable publicity other than to the degree that I think they should than when we got on the on the shot to the moon. And, uh, and it's unfortunate we're not communicating to them the real good that this government does for our people. What you say also concerns me. And, uh, you know, I'm the, uh, the representative of the of the employees of the government, and I'm the top employee in the government. I would say, not quite facetiously, that anybody who thinks they're being criticized as employee ought to pick up the newspaper every day <laughs> and uh, compare the criticism they get with the criticism I get every day. <clears throat> I don't object to it because I know that uh, constructive criticism can make us uh, do a better job and correct uh, errors in government or defects in the government that we might not otherwise have known about. The thing that I have tried to do is to acknowledge freely that there has been, ex say, excessive regulation, excessive red tape, excessive waste, excessive bureaucratic confusion, and, and on rare occasions, excessive fraud. And to point out that, that the rooting out of those things is not by me against the uh, two million federal employees, but, but it's me along with the, the overwhelming proportion of those federal employees, all of us trying to improve the government mechanism together. In other words, it's not me and the public against the federal employees, it's me and the federal employees as partners trying to make the, the federal government better. And, and I very seldom make a speech uh, anywhere in an agricultural area that I don't point out the uh, improvements that have been made in, uh, in uh, agriculture. Uh, Year before last, last year, again this year, we're setting uh, all-time records, for instance, in the export of agricultural products to foreign countries. This is something that, that, that everybody knows I didn't do, but this has been done by the superb professional economists and advisors and, and, and foreign sales experts within the Department of Agriculture. So I think there is a great deal of, of, of natural appreciation for what federal employees do. And, and the thing I want to do is to make us all not be satisfied and uh, not wince or, or cry aloud when we are criticized, but say we're trying to correct those, those defects and we're trying to make it so that we are not subject to legitimate criticism in the future. But I'm very pleased at, at how we have been uh, courageous enough to tackle some problems that, that have long existed in government. And, and I believe that we have uh, uh, begun to, to uh, convince the American people now that we are trying to root out those few instances of fraud and, and that we don't uh, try to cover up or, or, or hide those instances because we ourselves might be embarrassed. It is somewhat of a reflection on me as president, having been in office for two, two and a half years, to find that there's a, a, a person in the General Services Administration who is uh, violating the law. But I would rather root that person out and let the public know we're rooting him out than to leave that person there. Sure. And if I get part of the blame, I'm just willing to accept that. And I'm sure that most of the uh, civil servants are in the same category. Sustained personnel ceilings gets down to a point where it becomes not the positive, it becomes detrimental. I'm sure the government wants to do it where it's the most efficient. But 
but sustained personnel ceilings is a real burden. And I think that that area needs to be examined very thoroughly. I, I agree to some extent. Let me let me give it to you from my perspective. I have tried to restrain the growth in uh, total federal employment, but I've tried to do it in such a way as to eliminate excessive employees when a normal attrition takes place right. in areas where they're not needed. And then if we save 200 employees or 2,000 employees, if we can increase the number of uh, agricultural experts who sell American grain overseas, Amen. Amen. that's a good change, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's the kind of thing we're trying to do. But we have not cut down overall levels of employment. We have tried to maintain them constant, but we've tried to focus the need and and fill those needs, and we've tried to eliminate excessive employees where they are not needed. I can't deny that sometimes we make a mistake, and sometimes the, the, the impositions are arbitrary. But I have really tried to, uh, to look at it personally. Obviously, I have to take the recommendations of the head of your agencies and also of the Office of, of Management and Budget. But I, but I get involved in it personally and try to make the best judgment I can. Mr. President, uh I feel that many federal employees are concerned about health insurance, health benefits. Specifically, will the new health insurance plan contain a clause to cover dental, dentistry? The high cost of dentistry is not covered in the health, most health insurances that we have in government. Has any provision been made for that? Should I respond to that? I think I'd better let Alan go. <laughs> Please do. Yes, we are working with the carriers now about the possibility of including dental coverage in health plans. One of the, the, the difficulty is that dental coverage is very expensive and health coverage in general is becoming much more expensive. We hope hospital cost containment will help in that regard. But in order to include dental coverage, there would have to be a very substantial increase in cost of health insurance to both the employees and to the government. We are now looking very hard to see if there can be some cutback in some of the medical coverage in order to include dental, and then the employee can make a choice of the kind of package that he or she may want. Uh, we're very aware of it. Uh, we, we hope very much we'll be able to accomplish it, but within what we think are reasonable costs, it's going to be very difficult. I'd like to uh, get back to civil service reform, um, yes. which, which I, I agree is an effective step forward. Uh, one major concern I've run into is the merit pay implementation. Um, as a personnel director, I'm responsible for seeing that it's implemented effectively, but I don't think the employees feel that it can be done fair and equitably. Uh, I'd like to know your view and uh, follow on on that. Do you plan to extend uh, recommending merit pay to grade levels uh, other than 13 through 15 supervisory and managerial levels? The, the concept of the, of, the, uh, of the civil service reform laws was understood by me fairly well when we had the debates when I met with the congressional committees and when I went out and met with all the employees uh, in different agencies. And I think that, uh, that the, the idea was to try it at those particular pay levels first and make sure that we did have a uh, smoothly functioning uh, program before we extended it to other uh, pay levels. I think Scotty Campbell, uh, again, who sits in a biased position, <laughs> might very well come in on what he sees as the problems uh, in implementation and prospect and already discerned and maybe you could meet with with Scotty uh, later to see if you have any particular uh, cases where you don't think it has worked effectively you could discuss them with him but Scotty would you respond yes, to that? Yeah. Very briefly first may I say to reinforce what you said Mr. President about the senior executive service we are delighted that uh, of the over 3,000 who already have agreed to join only seven had said no uh, this is in contrast to the predictions we got during the period of passage and I think speaks very well for the federal employees at the top. They are willing to take risks. They are willing to be able, they are willing to be measured against their performance and uh, on the whole I would, I would argue that that is, is demonstration to the public and to all of us that we have a group of, of top managers in this government that are, that are willing to put their jobs on the line. In relation to merit pay, uh, there's no question that since we've not had performance appraisal in the federal government that, that amounted to anything, there's a great deal of concern among those at grades 13 through 15. 
Um, my own judgment is that we are making good progress. Uh, many of the agencies are, in, are now giving training in how you do performance appraisal. Uh, and my guess is that like the senior executive service, after people get through the first, the first uh, fear of change, that there will be a general acceptance of it. But it is difficult. It's going to take time. The private sector people tell you how difficult it is, but none of the major companies are thinking of abandoning it because if you don't have performance appraisal, what do you base decisions on? And that means you make automatic decisions and you lose what we hope will be brought out of it. I can just assure you, uh, Mr. President, that we're working very hard to provide training in how you do performance appraisal. We're working with the employees in doing so. And I think a year and a half from now, we will have the same kind of response to performance appraisal that we're now getting to the senior executive service. Mr. Scotty, how closely do you work with people like Ms. Garcia to, to make sure that the initial stages of it are working? We work very closely with the personnel directors across the government as well as with the assistant secretaries. And uh, I must say we learn as much from them as they learn from us and as we attempt to put these systems into place. But Scotty, our time's run out, but let yes. me say this. Uh, as we get into the uh, program on merit pay more thoroughly in the weeks and months ahead, I hope that if a problem does evolve, that, that, that where you and the personnel directors agree that we've uh, got an unforeseen problem, that you'll come to me and, uh, and let me know about it, and we'll see what we can do to alleviate the problem. I, I think that the, that the principle is, as you know, is very similar to the Senior Executive Service, that those that within a certain reservoir of funds, that the ones who do uh, superior work get a higher level of pay. And, and that, uh, I think, will be uh, an incentive for us all to, uh, to try to do a better job, to let the American people be truly proud of the outstanding work that, uh, that we uh, hope to continue to do uh, in federal government service. I I'm part of you, and uh, I'm very pleased today to have uh, you representatives of the different uh, agencies and also the different pay levels and also the different careers. Uh, come and meet with me. I've learned a lot in preparing for this meeting, and I've also learned a lot from your comments and questions, and I wish you well in the future, and I know you wish me the same. We'll do a good job for the taxpayers of our country. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you much, Scott. Thank you all. Thank you. This program was produced as a joint effort of the Office of Personnel Management and the Army Audiovisual Center for the information of more than two and a half million federal employees. For a printed copy of this program, see your personnel office or write the Office of Personnel Management, 1900 E Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20415.